On the broadcast tonight, the first in eight months, Vice Foreign Ministers of Korea and Japan discuss mending ties at a meeting in Seoul. A UN report shows North Korea has developed sophisticated ways to circumvent UN sanctions. And to boost regional economy, Korea plans to ease regulations on the use of areas freed from Greenbelt development restrictions. Early edition at 6 begins now. Excellence in flight. Korean Air. It is 5 a.m. in Washington, 5 p.m. in Kuala Lumpur, and 6 on a Wednesday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6 time, Moon Gon Young. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for joining us. For the first time in eight months, the vice foreign ministers of South Korea and Japan sat down face to face to discuss mending ties between the two countries. A number of issues came up, with the elephant in the room being the state of bilateral relations, which have reached a new low over Tokyo's continued distortion of historical facts. Our Hwang Sung-hee starts us off. Japanese Vice Foreign Minister Akitaki Saiki arrived in Seoul Wednesday for talks with his South Korean counterpart Cho Tae-yong. The meeting, which came at Tokyo's request, was the first Vice Foreign Ministerial level talks between the two neighbors in eight months. Tensions are high between South Korea and Japan over Japan's constant distortion of historical and territorial facts. Seoul feels as though Tokyo has never officially apologized for its sexual enslavement of roughly 200,000 women in the early 20th century, as Japanese politicians consistently make negative comments about the so-called comfort women. The diplomatic row has taken its toll on the South Korean public's perception of Japan. Public sentiment on Japan is so low that a recent poll released by the Asan Institute for Policy Studies show that South Koreans perceive Japan as a bigger threat than North Korea. According to the Asan poll, more than 65 percent of the South Korean public feel threatened by Japan, larger than the 60 percent of the population that fear North Korea. The figure reflects Seoul's overall consensus on Tokyo. And that, I'm sure, coincides with all the, the statements about comfort women, you know, the, the increased attention that Japan is playing, uh, paying towards Dokdo. And so all of these things are starting to drive up these, these threat perceptions. Now, of course, the question is, is there a real threat? Is it a real perceived threat? Or is it something that any time you include a question on Japan, you get a negative response? And it looks like the public sentiment in Seoul will remain low for a while, as Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe continues to press his right-wing policies. South Korean President Park Geun-hye is insistent she will not sit down with a leader who fails to acknowledge his country's historical wrongdoings. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Now, commenting on the frosty relationship between Seoul and Tokyo, South Korea's top military officer has stressed the importance of cooperating with Japan on security issues in the face of continued threats by North Korea. Arirang News' Kwon Su-ha reports. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Choi yun hee is on a week-long trip in the United States to reaffirm and strengthen the Korea-U.S. alliance and talk about security issues on the Korean Peninsula. He met with his counterpart, Army General Martin Dempsey, at the Pentagon on Tuesday, local time, for the first time since coming into the post last year. The two discussed a range of security issues, including bolstering combat readiness against North Korea. Choi also emphasized that Japan's cooperation is needed to deal with North Korean issues. Admiral Choi told reporters after the meeting that South Korea, the U.S. and Japan must form a tight trilateral partnership to deal with the constant and unpredictable threats posed by the North Korean regime. 
He also said he would keep an eye on the bilateral relationship between Korea and Japan while promoting security cooperation between the two countries. He added, however, that this does not constitute an immediate military alliance. Another topic that came up during the two-hour meeting between the two military officers was the transfer of operational control over South Korean forces from the U.S. to South Korea in the event of a war. But Choi told reporters it is not yet time to set a date for the transfer. He also expressed his hope for a comprehensive strategic partnership between South Korea and the U.S. in various fields, including politics, the economy and society, in addition to their solid military alliance based on 60 years of cooperation. Kwon so Arirang News. North Korea has developed an intricate web of measures to bypass U.N. sanctions placed on the regime for its nuclear weapons and missile programs. A new U.N. report says the North's embassies in foreign countries mask its illegal weapons trade. Shin se reports. Pyongyang has developed a number of sophisticated ways to get around U.N. sanctions on illegal weapons trading. A U.N. report was released Tuesday as part of an annual accounting of North Korea's compliance with international sanctions. The report says that the isolated nation has been employing complicated financial countermeasures that made purchases of prohibited products more difficult to trace. It also said the North Korean embassies in Cuba and Singapore are suspected of facilitating illegal weapons deals, including a shipment of fighter jets and missile parts seized on a North Korean cargo ship in Panama last year. The report adds that there is a relatively complex corporate ecosystem of foreign-based firms that help the regime evade scrutiny of its financial dealings. One of the examples cited was a contract by North Korea's national carrier, Air Korea, to purchase new jetliners in 2012. It said more than 100 payments were structured through eight Hong Kong registered companies. While the purchase of civilian aircraft is not prohibited under U.N. sanctions, the report says such unusual activity could be used as a test run for illegal transactions. Officials at Seoul's foreign ministry said South Korea will work with the international community to better enforce sanctions that are already in place. Pyongyang is currently restricted under U.N. sanctions from shipping and receiving cargo related to its nuclear weapons and missile programs. Importing luxury goods and illicit transfers of cash are also prohibited. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now to the latest on the North Korean flag tanker that docked in a rebel-seized Libyan oil port late last week. There are conflicting reports today over the fate of that ship. A Libyan naval official says a fire broke out on the ship Tuesday night local time, while other reports say it's on fire after it was hit by a missile which has escaped its naval resort. Now, it was on its way to the eastern coast of Benghazi after leaving Libya's El Sidra port, which is under the control of rebels. On Tuesday, the tanker broke through a naval blockade, taking advantage of poor weather conditions to head for the open sea. The 37,000 ton tanker is believed to have loaded over 30 million U.S. dollars worth of crude sold without the government's permission. Not facing. We apologize. Because we're all destroyed. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gon Yong and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. Proposal for talks are holding regular reunions for families separated by the Korean War. Their reason. The Korean government has unveiled a set of measures to boost the nation's regional economy. With the measures, the government expects to boost investments in regional economies by around $13 billion. Our Hwang Ji-hae has the details. The Korean government has been trying to spur the nation's economic recovery, and this time the focus is on regional economies. After a meeting led by President Park Geun-hye to foster trade and investment on Wednesday, the government laid out a set of measures to boost the regional economy. Under the latest plan, the government will help each municipal government develop a specialized industry like film and video industry for the southern port city of Busan and cultural content industry for the southwestern city of Gwangju. 
Restrictions on how to use areas freed from green belt will be eased and stronger incentives will be provided for private organizations developing park areas. The government added that it will provide support for business projects that were voluntarily proposed by 56 regional blocks to develop new growth engines. Among measures aimed at helping turning rural areas into economically vibrant spots is the lifting of development restrictions in forested zones. That will allow the construction of commercial facilities in the so-called green belt areas. The only exception for such areas has been home construction. Now, the government expects the measures to boost investment in regional economies by around 14 trillion won or roughly 13 billion U.S. dollars. It says no effort will be spared to promote corporate investment, which is the key to revitalizing regional economies. The government emphasizes that while the central government has unilaterally pushed for regional development so far, the measures this time around make local governments take the lead in drawing up their own development strategies. Hong Jie, Arirang News. Now, during this meeting on investment and regional development, President Park said her pledge for an era of public happiness will be realized when each region in Korea develops according to its own unique characteristics. Stressing how the local government and residents of each region know what's best for their own communities, the president highlighted there must be a paradigm shift in which area residents, not the central government, lead the way in creating regional development strategies. And another topic discussed at the meeting in the presidential office of Changwade was the government's ambitious plan to turn Korea into a Northeast Asian oil trading hub. Experts, however, are pointing out that while it sounds great in theory, the country faces daunting tasks to attract foreign participants. Our Nayeon Kyung has more. Becoming one of the world's major oil trading and storage hubs is what Korea is aiming for. Trade and Energy Minister Yoon Sang-jik said Wednesday that 1.8 billion U.S. dollars in private sector investment will go into securing oil storage terminals that can hold nearly 60 million barrels of oil. The government says it wants this complete by the year 2020. If all goes as planned, Korea would then have a greater storage capacity than Singapore, the world's third largest oil storage center. An annual oil trading volume of $25 billion is expected to be generated from 2021, and many billion dollars worth of economic benefits are expected in the next several years. The government hopes the terminals planned to be expanded in the country's southern cities of Ulsan and Yosu will help the country serve as a major oil trading hub. Policymakers plan to offer favorable loans, tax breaks and other incentives to oil traders setting up operations here, as well as eliminating red tape to create a better trading environment in the country. But some industry experts point out that the success of the government project will depend largely on the difficult task of building the financial infrastructure for the trading system. A researcher at the Korea Energy Economics Institute told Arirang News that one of the main problems is that the Korean won is not a major currency used in international trade, adding that reaching the government's goal of making Korea Northeast Asia's main oil hub could take well over a decade. Na hyun Kyung, Arirang News. The mystery surrounding Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 continues. The international teams looking for clues about the fate of the missing plane have expanded their search, while the families of the 239 people on board are demanding answers. Kim Hyun bin reports. The search for a missing Malaysian airliner stretched into its fifth day on Wednesday, with still no concrete evidence to explain what happened to the plane and the more than 230 people who are on board. With no sign of the plane, the search area has been expanded to an area that stretches all the way from China to the Adam and Sea, west of Thailand. This after Vietnam briefly scaled down its search operations after saying it had been getting mixed signals from Malaysia over the flight path of Flight 370. Authorities continue to look for clues. That may explain what happened. I think there's a lot of uh, speculation right now. Uh, some claims of responsibility that have not been, you know, confirmed or corroborated at all. Uh, we are looking at it very carefully. The Malaysian military says the plane was in the air for over an hour before it vanished from radar and had traveled about 500 kilometers off course. It added that the plane's transponder and tracking devices were switched off after the plane veered off track. 
Some experts speculate that there might have been a sudden electrical malfunction on the plane, pointing out that backup power would only last an hour. Officials have not ruled out the possibility of pilot suicide, as transponder signals are controlled in the cockpit. Adding to the confusion, a Malaysian newspaper quoted Malaysian Air Force Chief Razali Dodd on Tuesday as saying that military radar had tracked the missing plane to the Strait of Malacca. Razali denies he ever made the comments. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Back here in this country, Prime Minister Chang Wong won has issued a special statement urging the country's medical doctors to call off a six-day strike plan for later this month. The prime minister said the medical community should no longer inconvenience the public and should instead come to the negotiating table. He also expressed his deep regret about the one-day walkout held by the Korean Medical Association on Monday, protesting the government's reform measures. In response, the medical association welcomed Seoul's offer for a dialogue, saying it will actively engage in talks to end the current standoff. In another development, medical residents at four of Korea's five major hospitals now plan to walk out come March 24th after resident staff at the Seoul National University Hospital and the Asan Medical Center voted in favor of participating. We move on to some digits here in Korea. Data released by Statistics Korea on Wednesday shows that the number of newly employed workers in Korea rose at its fastest pace in 12 years in February showing signs of improvement in the local economy. Our Kim ji reports. The Korean economy may be showing signs of improvement. The number of newly employed workers rose at its fastest pace in more than a decade last month. Statistics Korea says the number of those employed in February stood at 24.8 million up 835,000 from a year earlier. The figure represents the largest on-year job growth since March 2002. The country's unemployment rate, however, shot up to 4.5 percent, a half a percentage point increase from the same period last year. In fact, the number of those unemployed stood at 1.2 million in February, the highest level in two years. The state-run agency points to an increase in the number of young people seeking jobs for the seemingly contradicting figures that show an increase in both the number of newly employed workers and unemployed people. Those in their 20s who are new college graduates are now searching for work ahead of recruitment season, which runs from late February to April this year. Kim Jung, Arirang News. Korea's three mobile carriers will be forced to suspend their businesses for 45 days starting tomorrow, Thursday that is, as punishment for providing subsidies to attract clients. The first two firms to undergo the disciplinary measure are KT and LG U+. KT will have its business suspended until April 26th, while LG U+, was ordered to close its doors until April 4th, and again from the 27th to May 18th. Now, SK Telecom will be suspended from April 5th to May 19th. During the suspension, the companies are prohibited from attracting new customers and users will be banned from changing their mobile devices unless it has been damaged, lost or used for more than two years. A recent study by the Asian Development Bank shows Korea is among the few Asian countries showing signs of slower growth due to rising inequality. The study titled Rising Inequality in Asia and Policy Implications was released in February and indicates that 12 countries in the Asia-Pacific region, including Korea, China and Indonesia, have experienced growing income inequality between 1990 and 2010. For in-depth analysis of this problem and the possible remedies, we are joined live in the studio by Dr. Oh Jin Hwan, professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at Ihua Women's University. Dr. Oh, welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Uh, first, uh, briefly tell us uh, how serious the problem is, this income inequality problem in this country. Okay, well, um, there are many uh, economic indicators uh, that measure uh, income disparity or inequality across the, the, the countries. Let me take an example of the Gini coefficient, which is the most uh, commonly used one, which is the most uh, frequently used one. Um, that, uh, according to the numbers, like a zero in the, the Gini coefficient stands for perfectly equal distribution, 
while the one is at the other extreme where the perfectly unequal distribution where one person is everything. Um, the most equal distribution comes from northern European countries where their genes are somewhere around 0 0.2 and 0 0.25. And the other extreme is uh, like a Latin, Latin America or as, like Africa where their genes are well above like a 0 0.4 or even 0 0.5. South Korea uh, is somewhere around 0 0.3 like a slightly below or like above, depending on the data. So like that is uh, similar to Western Europe or similar to North America, sometimes better than that. So if you look at the number, the number itself is not that bad. But what is uh, the problem is that it's this growing rate. Mm -hmm. so compared with uh, like a, a two decades, like uh, the growth rate is, uh, is, is really high. And that is uh, the major concern from, 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 from this study, I guess. Well, uh Fifth fastest among 28 Asian countries. That's where Korea stands in terms of growth income inequality. So what is the core problem here, Dr. Ho? Well, um, so you can see that uh, there is a, like a, like a principle in uh, the like economics textbook that we face like, trade-offs. And uh, the most uh, famous uh, trade-offs that uh, we are talking about is the trade-off between efficiency and uh, inequality. So uh, the fact that, that these countries, uh, like inequality is growing, is the evidence that uh, we still like uh, pursue like a uh, like, uh, uh, efficiency-oriented policies, like a uh, pro-growth pro policies. The thing is that um, like uh, that these countries' uh, internal and external like uh, environment is keep changing, and uh, we are no longer a, a f like a rapidly growing uh, developing countries. But what we are implementing is basically similar to what we used to do, like uh, before. So the gap between what we are facing. And uh, what we are implementing is, is quite uh, like a big, and I think uh, there's the, where the, starts, uh, the problem starts from. Well, you know, uh, such income disparity cannot be good news for the overall economy. How does it uh, impact the Korean economy? Right, uh, that's uh, really um, it's important uh, because, uh, like, uh, as I told you, that it used to be like uh, some, some, some trade off between uh, like efficiency and uh, inequality. So if, 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 if you pursue one, then we, can, we can, can lose the other one. But the thing that we are facing now is that. Uh, uh, our country's uh, like economy is again slowed down. So growth is, 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 uh, is, is uh, slowed down, but at the same time, inequality is rising. So the worst scenario is that we might uh, lose uh, both one. So that's something that we, we have to really avoid. Well, it looks like we have the vessel and contents and various factors around it, not really uh, you know, maintaining a good balance as it grows together here in Korea, but also in other parts of the world. It's a, it's a global uh, issue. The global economy is suffering from growing income disparity as well. So, Dr. Ho, we are hoping you can maybe suggest a possible substantial remedy for this plague. Well, um, that's uh, quite uh, challenging questions to, to answer because uh, the major driving forces for um, this globalization and, and growth is in fact the driving forces for inequality as well. Like, uh, I mean, um, like technological advance and uh, some market-based uh, liberalization has led to overall growth, but it also caused a falling share of the labor income and, and some other disparity across regions. So from which all this benefit has been skewed to a certain sectors. So we may have uh, some overall gains from, from, from those kind of policies, like uh, there's some net uh, like, uh, gains, but uh, it does not mean that everybody inside the uh, like, economy is, is happier. Like uh, there's, there's some people who are really happy, but there's some people who are definitely worse off. And um, we, we some, so we really have to like, consider those kind of uh, like uh, losing sectors. But uh, the problem is that if we, if we focus like, too much on this, uh, carrying these kind of uh, like, uh, equality things, we might uh, end up losing this uh, efficiency or like, uh, lose like, uh, momentum for further growth. So like, uh, the, the, the important thing is to keep the balance to between these two, which is uh, really uh, difficult and challenging yeah. to achieve. Definitely, definitely efficiency and inequality to keep a balance there. So how should the Korean government go about to tackle this uh, growing income disparity or inequality problem? Right. Um, so before I uh, answer the question, there's uh, like a one uh, relationship that measures um, our income level and, 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 and inequality. And uh, it used to have, a, it, it tends to have some, some inverted U patterns. That means like uh, inequality tends to grow where we have uh, some more income, but uh, that, that is uh, starting to decrease at a certain threshold. And I, I think uh, that South Korea is uh, somewhere in that uh, threshold. So I mean, if we are successful with, with so many policies, then our income may uh, keep, keep increasing, but uh, with a decreasing uh, like, uh, growth, uh, as an inequality, I'm sorry. But uh, if those policies are not that successful, then maybe uh, income may get stuck somewhere in the middle, like a middle income trap, but the inequality keeps, keeps soaring. So, um, 
the, the important thing that I just uh, mentioned like, before is, is that like, there should be some, some fundamental shift of this uh, policy paradigm to, to change, to, some, to, 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 to emphasize more about this like, uh, some, some, some income distribution. But, but that, does, that does not mean that we have to really like, forget about this kind of uh, efficiency or growth things. So the balance is really important, but that's always really difficult to, to tackle. And, and for example, like, uh, if, if I can give you one more example, like, like uh, FTA, it's a free trade agreement, they can be uh, really uh, some good example for like, uh, that, 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 that increase the size of the pie, but it does not mean that everybody inside the country can gain from that uh, trade. So, uh, so we, we, whenever we have a, like a free trade agreement with uh, other countries, so we focus, we are interested in how much gain we can get, how much like, uh, size of the pie we can increase. But we are not that much interested in this kind of uh, the other side, like a compensation scheme, how can we compensate the like, losing sectors? And that's what we really need to pay extra attention to it. Yeah. Okay, well, I uh, wish we had more time for one, two, or three examples, and of course, four or five solutions or possible remedies for this uh, problem. But apparently, this is not going to be solved overnight. It is a very tedious one. A lot of uh, right. yeah, balance, uh, give and take, and of course, maintaining a focus on different sectors. Well, Dr. Oh Jin Wan, thank you for coming here. We look forward to you coming back and shedding some light on many other issues in the future. Okay, thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of our newscast. Thank you for watching. This has been Daniel Che. And I'm Moon Gan Young. Thank you as always for being here with us. Have a wonderful rest of the evening, and we'll see you right back here, same time tomorrow. Good night.